Chapter 1, Colliding Worlds, 1450 to 1600. This is the early exploration era, early colonization of North America and specifically what would become the United States. So always look at a title of a chapter and try to determine what your author's telling you is about to come. Colliding Worlds, it doesn't sound, sound very good, okay? So we're talking about the new world here, this, this world that... The Europeans didn't know it was there, and, and they ran into it by accident. They were trying to get to China, and they had no idea that North and South America were in the way. So so this is the New World. Of course, that's a somewhat of an insulting uh, definition of these lands. There were millions and millions of people living there, so it wasn't new to them. They've been there for 15,000 years. Okay, so and, and we start to set the stage for who's going to collide with who, okay? Okay, the official title of this class is History 101 or 109, depending on what campus you're in, United States History Through Reconstruction. So United States History. So, so when does the history of the United States actually start? I mean, officially, you would say 1776 when independence was declared. <clears throat> uh, so is that where we should start in this class? Well, I, I think we'll, we'll see. The truth is we would miss an awful lot. If we did that, a whole lot happened, you know, for hundreds of years, thousands of years before that moment. We're, we're going to get there soon enough, but we really have to set the stage here first and tell you how, how you know, the, the events that led up to this, uh, this incredible revolution. Uh, so to have a clear picture and determine how the people and the land. So understand land and geography is a huge part of human history. It's important to understand the, the impact geography has on, on the human condition. In order to understand this, we need to go, go back a lot further than that. So how far am I going to go back? I'm then going to go back to the beginning uh, when human beings emerge. So you're going, what? We're not going to stay here for long. But but uh, the only real way to get a get a a feel and a grasp on what's happening in this country today, you've got to go back to the beginning to see how human development evolved and how we turned out to be the way that we are today. So the scientific hypothesis about where human beings began, and this has been verified through DNA testing. According to modern science, human beings evolved into the species we are today from East Africa in a place called the Great Rift Valley or an area. So there on the right side of the of the uh, image there, our, our slide, you see that, that kind of blue smudge. That's the Great Rift Valley. <clears throat> this is where science has determined that the first human beings you know, emerged from. That doesn't mean there wasn't any people like people here before that or human being like people. It, it means that it's the first time that a Homo sapien began. They evolved from whatever, you know, whatever species they, they evolved from before them. So the point I'm trying to make is that there were, there were you know, uh, species that were very close to human-like on the, on the planet for, you know, uh, many, many thousands of years before the human beings emerged. So it wasn't like there was nobody here and one day the human beings showed up. It, no, it's, 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 it's evolution. So, so scientists today say that, that, that modern humans came from a single group of ancestors in the Great Rift Valley, and this happened 200,000 years ago, okay? Uh, and this is the idea of evolution. So I'm talking about science here. <clears throat> okay, this is what science believes. I realize that there's a flip side to it, and it's faith, but we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, so looking at this pretty famous uh, image here, this, you know, you... Humans are evolving, progressing, getting better and better as, as the eras and, the, and time goes on. Another million years, we, we might be way down the, you know, in the middle of this or, or even at the back of it um, you know, as we are today. Uh, so, so modern humans continued to evolve in Africa and finally spread to the Middle East possibly as early as 160,000 years ago. So I said that they emerged 200,000 years ago. But they don't go anywhere else until 160,000 years ago. So for 40,000 years, they really didn't do very much. They didn't, they didn't emanate out very much. Now, to, to get a grasp on how long 40,000 years is, if you think back from today back to the time of Jesus Christ, that's 2,000 years. Now, that's a long time. I mean, we, we can't relate to how long that is. 
But to relate to how many years 40,000 is, when these people were mostly in the same place, it's like going back to the time of Jesus Christ uh, 20 times, okay? So it's it's a huge amount of time where they didn't really, you know, progress or, or, or at least at least spread out, okay? Why wouldn't they do that? Well, you know, in those days, I, I wouldn't call these people cavemen, but but it was a rough life. I mean, you had to survive every day. It wasn't about, you know, what what horizons can we can we uh, challenge today and and gain for ourselves? No, you're looking for food, water, shelter, heat. You know, uh, stay away from wild animals that want to eat you. You know, you're you live in a in a pretty primitive life uh, style. So, you know, it takes years before you, you spread out. Part of it, too, is that there's not roads and trails and, you know, uh, airplanes and trains. It's all overgrown. You know, imagine the earth if, if, if humans weren't here to manicure it. It'd be overgrown everywhere. So it's difficult to, to you know, find a path through all, all, the, all the wildlife, okay, all, all the overgrowth, I should say. Okay, modern humans only became well established elsewhere in the world in the last 50,000 years. So another 110,000 years goes by before you, you, we could say that human beings ended up being in, in all parts of the globe, okay? Okay, so the, so the religious counter to science's point of view is, is, of course, the idea of creation and the Garden of Eden. So the Garden of Eden uh, would be located in what today is is Iraq, but it is is called in, in the ancient times we call it Mesopotamia. So if you look at these two rivers right here, uh, you have the Tigris and Euphrates River. This 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 is the cradle of early humans right here. Okay, uh, and again this this would be you know in in Iraq today. Okay, so the the idea of the religious story of creation starts here with the with Adam and Eve. Okay, God creates Adam and Eve and you know puts them in paradise, but but they sin, so they have to go out and and, fa and live in the world and face the world. Okay. Um, and then of course later you have Noah's Ark. So God is unhappy with people on the planet. They're greedy, selfish, manipulative, and he decides he wants to do a reset, start over. So he comes to Noah and, and tells Noah build this huge ark and take a, a male and female species of every, every animal. And it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And it, it, when it starts to rain, get in your ark and the ark will rise with the floods and, and you'll be fine. You, and then, you know, wait it out. And then when the rain stop, the water will subside. You'll come back down to earth and come out and, <clears throat> and repopulate. So, you know, you can essentially say we're all, all of us, any human being on the planet, doesn't matter what you look like, all of us are related to Adam and Eve and Noah if you are a person, uh, you know, that's, that is, uh, uh, believes in the creation story, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to make here is, is whether you believe that, that uh, humans came from the Rift Valley like science does or the Middle East like, like uh, religion does. Uh, you know, either either side, either side fits into our story. Okay, it's it's generally the same area. Whichever one it is, early human beings emerge, and and they, like I said, they eventually connect. I'm sorry, migrate to all the points of the globe. So this is an interesting idea. If we're all related to each other, and science would would, would agree with that, and so would so would faith or religion. We're all connected to each other biologically, to the earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. So that's probably more of a science uh, uh, slogan there. So why do I say that? Because you talk, this is what evolution is. If you, if you look at the science story, and I'm not going to get deep into it, but of course you have the Big Bang, boom, the universe is is created from this massive uh, uh, force of energy, and and all these all these pieces go flying out there, and each piece has chemical compounds that that mix together with the right other chemical compound, creates the basis for life. Okay, so we're we're related to the or to the, we're connected to the universe atomically in that way, to the earth chemically because 
again, human beings evolved from it, like like all life. We all evolved from the earth, and then to each other biologically. Where every every human on this planet is ninety eight to ninety nine percent genetically the same. Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter if you're tall, short, dark, light, red hair, black hair. It doesn't matter. Large, small. Humans are one species. There's not a subspecies. There's only one species, and. Uh, you you can't say that there's one one race is better than the other because whatever your reason it is and one's inferior one's superior many many people feel that uh, that that does not scientifically stand up and there's much evidence against it human beings haven't been around long enough to evolve into a separate or a subspecies many animals do you know you can look at the animal kingdom and you might find a type of animal that that one is smarter than, than the other species or, or one is faster or what you, whatever it might be you can make the argument that that in that in the animal kingdom some species are are superior to other subspecies but you can't make that argument with human beings because we're one species okay that's that's very very important to understand and would would do much towards solving the racial problem in America today if everybody would see that, learn about it, and accept it, okay, that that would put a, you know, it, it would be a big, a big leap, okay. Uh, so going back to this idea of evolution, um, which of course is counter to creation. This is this is the counter argument. Creation says that God created uh, uh, humans in His image. Uh, but science doesn't agree with that. Science says no, it, it, uh, species evolve. And this is the theory of natural selection. Okay, so I don't want to, we don't have to look at A, B, or uh, A or B. Let's just go to C here. So you look at the image on the right at the bottom that that leopard or tiger or cheetah is about ready to pounce on that antelope or whatever it might be. So letter C, every organism faces a constant struggle to survive, and, and that little antelope's in trouble, right? Uh, Organisms best suited for their environment survive. So who do you think is going to survive in this case? I mean that that leopard or whatever that is tiger uh, is is going to it has a leg up, right? This is called survival of the fittest. That that the you know uh, organisms that, that survive you know are the are the ones that that continue on. Uh, and they pass their traits on to their offspring. So Darwin's theory didn't have a whole lot to do with human beings. It really had to do with the animal kingdom. But people took this theory and spun it a different way and said, well, that explains it. I'm in the superior group. I'm the survival of the fittest group. And, and these people down here are inferior and less than me, so I'm better than them. And, and again, racism, discrimination, subjugation, oppression begins. But again, you can't make that argument. We're only one species, okay? Uh, okay, so the theory of evolution. So the crux of Darwin's theory of evolution focuses on the elimination of inferior species gradually over time through a process called natural selection. So there it is. That's, that's the one right there that get, gets everybody in trouble because that comment, elimination of inferior species, is, is what I was saying before. And people that, that make this about race and, and justify racism through Darwin, Darwin's theories, are called social Darwinists, where they feel that the, that the dominant human species should dominate and, and crush the inferior ones. And, okay, so that, again, that would not be, that would not please Darwin to hear that that's how people, um, you know, saw his theory, okay? Uh, so a species adapts to its environment, changes occur to allow the species to survive. This is called Darwin's survival of the fittest. So for, for a, an example, and this, this is a little bit of an exaggerated example, I'll give you two here to, to explain this. Okay, let, let's, let's say that you're a little amphibian, a little, a little slippery amphibian crawling around through the mud and the water and the jungle. And... The problem is you and your kind keep on getting stepped on by elephants as they walk by and they crush you. 
So if these elephants keep on crushing all of all of you, you're, you're going to be extinct, and your and your your species will be gone. So over time, you develop a shell, a hard shell. Now you're a turtle, and so, someone explained to me how a turtle got a shell if it wasn't for that. When a turtle is, uh, you know, un, under attack or or fearful, he, the turtle's head and arms, legs, whatever you want to call them, go inside the shell. And now you can kick that shell, throw that shell, hit that shell, and the inside, the organism inside, won't be hurt. That's that's the that's an extreme example of of uh, evolution. Okay. What what about the animal that that can't get up to the fruit in the trees, but all the other animals can? So it goes hungry because they're not tall enough. They don't have a long enough neck. So over time, they they in order to survive, they need a longer neck. So uh, it, part of evolution is that they develop a long neck. So again, it sounds a little bit, you know, extreme, but but tell me, why does a giraffe have a long neck like the shell and the turtle? Where'd they come from if there wasn't a reason for it, okay? So that's a couple of examples. Now, the idea of, of evolution, it's not just ape to men, okay? And people don't like that. People don't like saying that we came from chimpanzees or, or or apes. Well, I mean, I understand that because chimpanzees and apes have been mostly presented to human beings as, you know, insultingly. Uh, they're actually very bright uh, species of, of animals. But, but tell me, if you didn't evolve from a chimpanzee or an ape, who did you evolve from? Well, I mean, the theory actually says that that man came, all all species came out of the ocean. Why, why from the ocean? Because at one time, this entire planet was covered with water, okay? And species in the water were evolving, and slowly, this is an extreme exaggeration here, but uh, you go from a seahorse to a man, okay? And you see that on the in the middle there, some, some learn how to fly, okay? So this is all... All this theory about survival of the fittest, okay. So, okay, that sounds nice, but people say, okay, but but if we're all the same, and, and th this is nice, but if we're all the same, and and we we're related to each other, why do we look so different? Okay, and and the answer, science's answer, is is to continue in evolution because that's what it's all about, according to science. You know, why, why are people taller, stronger, faster today than they were in the 1800s? You know, the average height of a man is much taller today. Women, too. Uh, you know, uh, longer lives, uh, healthier. And I, I get we're in the modern world. But but understand, we, we, we as, as, as the years go by, and I don't mean 20 or 30, I mean, you know, thousands of years, uh, species adapt and, and change, in, including human beings. So so why do we look so different then? Okay, but so going back to whether whether you want to believe in science that people came out of Africa or you want to believe in faith that people came out of the Middle East. It's it's they're right next door to each other. Uh, I mentioned that after a period of time they start to emanate out and to see what's out there. So so one group from Africa or Middle East goes north. They they, they go across the Mediterranean Sea, and now they're on what's, what today would be Europe. And they, and they keep going north, and they go all the way up to Switzerland and Norway and Finland, and they're way up there. So what's it like up there? Uh, it's cold much of the year. You also have uh, much of the year you're in total darkness, or you have very few hours of sunlight per day. Uh, so what so what happens to people, regardless of what color their skin is, what happens to people that live in a place like that where you're not going to be outside very much, you're going to be inside because it's cold, and when you do go outside, there's no sun. What happens to, to, to your skin? It, it, it pales. It starts to lose its color. Okay, so if, if we came out of the Middle East, you know, the tip, people there are typically – even today, I mean, a, a Middle Eastern would be described as as light brown. Okay, uh, light brown people go all the way up to Sweden and Norway, and over over a long period of time, their their skin changes because of the weather and their environment. And you, you, where where are white people from? White people are from Europe, essentially. Okay, on the other side of the coin, if you go south. 
They emanate, emanate out, of, out of your ears and go south into deep Africa, down by the equator. What's it like down there? It's hot. The sun never goes away in the summer. You're so close to the equator. You have lots of sun every day, and it's hot and humid, and it's a tough place to survive. Those pale people in the, in, up in northern Europe would have a tough time living there every day. But the people that came down there, they, they, they start to develop color in their skin to help them protect themselves from the rays of the sun. Uh, and, and so there you have it. So light brown people turn white going north, they turn, they turn uh, dark going, uh, going south. Does that answer the whole thing? I mean, it's, that's just in a nutshell. I mean, there's lots of variables there. <laughs> but in a nutshell, that is... Darwin's theory of evolution, that's how one species with 99% the same can look so different, okay? Okay, um, so let, let's talk about these people. How did they get to what became the United States, okay? Uh, I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're talking about emanating from Northern Africa here, so, you know, how, how do you get all the way to the United States, Um uh, but so as they move across Asia, <clears throat> so looking at this map, we're talking about emanating out of here, going north, up up to here, or down here. You, you know, uh, uh, light people, dark people. But now slowly you're you're moving, moving across in thousands of years. But finally, someone gets to right here. Okay, now that that today is Russia, and then right across that little straight there, 53 miles of water is Alaska. That's the United States today. Okay. Um, so when, if, if you are a, a person in this era and you get to this point of, of what today is Russia, it's far enough away that you can't see it. It's 53 miles. You can't see it. So, so in your mind, it, it could be, you know, an, an ocean till the end of time. You don't, you don't know. Okay. Uh, but what happens is, um, you have an ice age. Okay. Uh, and this is the last ice age that we've had. And the upper reaches of, of the world were frozen. So what happened is this little strait called the Bering Strait froze and it became an ice bridge. It, it was more like a land bridge, but it was frozen. You can walk across. So, so this, this truly is, is where these people came from. And 13,000 from 13,000 years ago, and I'm sorry, from between 13,000 and 3,000 BCE, during the last ice age, many, many, you know, millions of people come into what today is Canada, the United States, and then finally South America, Mexico. Let's take a, a sidebar here. I just said, I just said, uh, thir between 13,000 and 3,000 BCE. So what does BCE mean? Well, for for as long as I can remember, we've always measured time by B.C. and A.D. We always measured time around the birth of, of Jesus Christ. So B.C. means before Christ. A.D. means Anno Domini, or in the year of our Lord. It does not mean after death. If that's not what it means. If we went by B.C. and A.D. after death, we would lose the 33 years of his life. So uh, the year of our Lord, in the year of our Lord, year one, that's the year he was born, okay? So we've always measured time around this this Christian figure, okay? Uh, so, of course, we, you know, we, we live in different times now. Uh, and it's a politically correct world we live in, PC. So what does that mean? And, and people get angry about it. But, you know, in, in, in my day, you know, in a group of, of friends when I was in high school or whatever, that, that kind of age, young, you know, you people didn't think about what they said. You you can make a crass comment in in a crowd, and you, you think that's funny. Okay, you make a gay joke in a crowd of six, seven people, but you don't know that two people are gay, so you're insulting them, or cracks against women, or cracks against someone's religion, or cracks against somebody's, you know, uh, job or socioeconomic status, whatever it is. It's degrading, insulting. Okay, so, so what we try to do today is neutralize all those p potentials that could cause a problem. Okay, so before I go on, I, I'm 
I want to just just preface that I'm not criticizing Christianity here. I'm not doing that at all. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I'm, I'm not the person that came up with the BCE and CE. I'm just telling you where it came from. So the idea is that, yes, uh, Christians are, are a huge part of the of the world. One third of the people in the world are Christian, but that's, that's you know, more than any other religion. But that also means that, that if, if one third are Christian, two thirds are not. So in order to not be insulting or offensive to them, because for example, um, you, you know, you, you uh, a, a Christian probably would not want to uh, measure time against, say, Buddha. Okay, that that would be insulting to them. So it's the same type of idea. But let's just take religion out of the idea of telling time. Telling time and marking time, it, it's somewhat of a scientific and, and perhaps historical kind of idea. So l let's not make it about a religious figure or leader. So instead of saying B.C. before Christ, we now say B.C.E. before the Common Era. Instead of saying A.D. Anno Domini, we now say C.E. Common Era. So I, I said we now say. I shouldn't say that. Many people still use B.C. and A.D., but I would imagine in the next 10 years, you probably won't see much of B.C. or A.D. The fact is, we still are measuring time around the birth of Christ because it's been so accepted for so long. But now it's, you know, before his, his birth was before the common era and after his birth is the common era, okay? Okay, so so back to our story about people coming to the Americas. Um, okay, so so the the ice age happens and and you you come across this uh this little strait there it says the Bering strait here on the on the upper image right right here this this freezes over or it's right here and people flood over okay so this this image on the right kind of shows you what i'm talking about the the light blue that's all frozen so the entirety of canada the entirety of alaska and East Asia, North Asia, Northern Europe, it's all frozen. So that's where, that's that gave people the opportunity to come across. So understand, that's the first time. This is many, many years after. <clears throat> this is this is probably 175, 180,000 years after humans emerged in Africa or the Middle East. So. Human history in North and South America is much younger than anywhere else, Asia or Africa or Europe, because they didn't come here until much, much later, okay? Uh, so the people that did come, these, these truly are the first Americans. So we talk a lot about immigration today, and there's lots of conflict about that, and lots of issues, and, and you know, people of color in America are still having a rough time gaining equality and, and, and having access to their constitutional rights. Um, and you understand that the, that the first indigenous peoples were, were, the, were the, um, what, what we would become known as the American Indians or the Native Americans. That's who it was here, okay? These people came over from Asia probably, but, but essentially those are the first people, those are the true Native Americans, okay? And any, any, other, any other race... Or, or type of people can't claim that. Okay, only only Native Americans can. Okay. Um, so using science's timeline, there's been people here for 15,000 years in North and South America and have been developing and evolving ever since, like every anywhere else, which is, by the way, 13,500 years before our, our pal Columbus discovered America. Now, we, we don't say that, that anymore. I, I'm being facetious. Of course, when I was young, that's what he did. Columbus was a big hero. He discovered America. Well, I mean, what about the native people? Well, they, they didn't, there wasn't very many of them. They didn't matter. They were running around in the weeds naked. They, they, they didn't know it. No, there was millions of people here. And, and some, as you'll see, very, very, uh, you know, pro progressive and advanced societies that, that, that far surpassed anything in Europe at that time. But we don't know that much about these people because they're prehistoric, meaning before written records. They didn't write it down. They didn't have that, that ability. So we rely on modern-day anthropology and archaeology to fill in a lot of blanks for us. And, and we now have some evidence of some pretty sophisticated societies. So the bottom line 
and the most important thing to take from this lecture is that these ancient American societies, they were not primitive. They were vibrant, quite modern for their time. Uh, societies existing in what they called the New World. Now, not, I'm sorry, they didn't call it. The Europeans call it that. But North and South America, or the ancient Americas, were a place where diverse peoples had long struggled against and sometimes worked with one another, where societies and political systems had long risen and fallen, and where these ancient trends continued <clears throat> right through the period of colonization. Okay? Okay, let's do this. Let's do our first supplemental lecture. Number one, this is called the history of trade. So if you have not read the instructions about what these are or listen to the video tutorial or, or read the grading guidelines, please pause the video and go do that. Uh, this is not complicated. It's not difficult, but this seems to be the place where many students stumble. And, and I've learned over the number of years I've been doing, doing this that they stumble because they're not paying attention. They're not putting their time and they're not listening to the instructional videos. They're, they're all there for a reason. Modules week one, scroll down to assignment instructions. Uh, announcements, uh, scroll down to the one entitled uh, assignment instructions, and they're all there in, in, in probably more detail than you ever wanted to, to know, okay? But just briefly, I'm going to talk to you about what these are. So in the, in the midst of a lecture that, like we're doing right now, I, I for the most part, not, not 100%, but for the most part, I try to follow the, the chapter. So you, what you're reading about, what you're studying about, what terms you're defining are what we're, are what I'm talking about. Okay, I, I, I might go in a, you know, meandering direction in, in doing so. I'm not going to go page by page, and and I try to add interesting points of view that perhaps aren't in the book. But, but a supplemental lecture is kind of outside of the book and it's separate from the book. So I want you to, when we get to this point, and we're going to have eight of these before the midterm, and they're going to have eight more before the final. When you, when, we, when you get to a supplemental lecture, take separate notes for it. I'm going to give you an outline also, so I'm going to show you that here next. Uh, so you, you should have eight outlines and eight detailed notes about this lecture. And then when the midterm and final exam come, part one is multiple choice. Part two is essay questions. You're going to choose three of these to write about. So you're going to have eight that we do. When you open up your exam, I'm going to take away two random. I'm not going to tell you which ones. You'll have six to choose from. You write three. What's important to understand is I'm asking you to review this lecture. I'm not asking you to do research on the history of trade. I'm not asking you to go to the library and get three primary sources and cite all these people and put it in a certain type of, of formatting. It's, 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 it's much simpler than that, okay? It's simply a review. So when you review something, that, that means that you're not adding things that the presenter didn't say. That would not be a review, okay? So I made the analogy in the uh, instructional video, and I told you there that you, you're going to hear me say this a dozen times. The best analogy I have is you and your friend have a hobby, and you're excited to learn that the that the the known expert of your hobby, the leader in your hobby, is going going to come to your town and give a presentation about your hobby. So you and your, you and your friend are ecstatic. And you can't wait to go. You get tickets, and the whole thing's exciting. But the day of the of the presentation, your friend gets sick, and your friend says, "Please, I, I I'm so upset. Please write down everything that presenter says. Okay, I don't want to miss anything. Okay, so you, you as a good friend do you do that? You, you come home from the presentation. You're gonna see your friend the next morning. <clears throat> you come home. You, you then wouldn't get on the internet and add a bunch of stuff just to kind of make it look better. You wouldn't do that because your friend doesn't care about that, even, even if it's good information. Your friend wants to know what the presenter said, and that's it. So that's where people go wrong here. They, they try to you know, uh, add to it, perhaps you're trying to impress me. You don't have to try to impress me. I'm already impressed, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, you, you guys are all awesome college students, so so uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, also, people, so that's one place where people go wrong. The other the other part is that they don't listen to any of this at all. They don't watch these. They don't write notes. 
the exam comes, the history trade, they go on Google, the history trade, and they cut and paste a bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with what I said. And it's very easy for me to, to figure that out. So that's the two places where people people go wrong. Okay, so it's it's a review. So I mentioned in the instructional video, you, you may have a, a position one day where your department head sends you to, you know, on, on a trip somewhere to, to see a presentation about software that's going to change your company's, you know, uh, greatly uh, influence them positively. Your your department head, your boss wants you to go and come back and present to the department. Well, you're not going to add stuff that, you know, out of the blue because that wouldn't be a review. So that's what you're doing. So an effective review of a 15 minute, 20 minute, the most lecture shouldn't be five pages long. Okay. An effective supplemental lecture review is typically around a page give or take. Okay. I, I don't have a minimum or maximum on these because some people just write differently. What I'm trying to make is I'm not asking you to go into a long dissertation. You've only got 25 minutes a piece for these. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I understand that you need to follow the outline, uh, and let, let, let's go to the outline next. So here's our outline for the history of trade. So I'm going to give you an outline for every one of these, okay? Now, if you've had my classes before, you, you might say, well, that, that looks a little bit toned down. And, and it is because I I just found that many many students were just simply writing their essay from the outline. I, I uh, So I'm trying to make it a little bit, not, not I wouldn't say difficult, but you, you really do have to listen to this. If you listen to it, take notes, all the, all, you'll understand all of this, okay? Uh, I'm just trying to make it make people, uh, you know, uh, do what they're supposed to do. Okay. So I always give you the outline <clears throat> when you write your essay. Follow the outline. Okay. So and so every every one of every supplemental lecture has three parts. One is introduction, the top, and at the bottom. And I'm going to skip the middle right now. At the bottom, you see relevance. You, those are always there. Anything in between introduction and relevance are the main points. It, it doesn't say main points, but those are the main points. So there's three parts to every supplemental lecture. Intro, main points, relevance. So people many times tend to jump over the introduction, get right to the main points, that's three points off. Or you write the whole thing and you're done with the main points, you don't say the relevance, that's three points off. So understand, you, you're you're being asked to write three sections here. Intro, and I'm talking about a, you know, a paragraph uh, or two. Uh, you know, I don't go into a long, long intro, but I set the stage. Anytime you do any kind of presentation about anything, you can't assume that people know what you're talking about, even when it's pretty obvious that they do. You've got to at least set the stage so they know what context you're putting it in. So introduction is very important. Then you go to the, to the next it, it could be two, three, four, five. It just depends on each essay. Uh, in this case, <clears throat> the main points are trade by waterway, trade by land. So intro, you're going to tell me about trade by waterway and trade by land. Okay. Then at the end, you're going to give me <clears throat> the relevance. So again, if you have my classes before, you don't see it there. I'm, I'm going to give it to you, but at the end of the of the lecture itself. So essentially, you can print this or or write it down. And as you're doing your notes, you're, you're filling in the blanks. Then you write it from from the from the uh, as the uh, outline itself. So what I mean by that, don't do the relevance first. Don't <clears throat> don't spread the relevance out across the uh, the the essay. If it's difficult for me to find, you're not going to get full points. The relevance is perhaps the most important part. So I want that to be last. You can bold it, you can underline it, you can you can write it word for word if you'd like. You can put relevance with a underline against it. Whatever it takes, make it a separate uh, you know, paragraph. That's okay. The rest of your essay I want you to write in a typical college essay form, okay? Um, you know, use paragraphs, indenture paragraphs, all those types of things. Uh, I mean that's really kind of it. There is no there is no need for a title or a header here. It's not the same as a as a film reflection. You, you don't have any of that, okay? Uh, but but please indent your paragraphs in one long paragraph. I, I get a lot on 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 uh, midterms and finals. That's difficult to read, guys, and, and it's it makes it very hard to grade. You're going to have a much better chance at a better grade with more paragraphs because the, the human mind just works that way, okay? Okay, so uh, so the I, I, I 
announced to you we're doing a supplemental lecture here. You, you look at the slide, you get the number and the name of the of the lecture. You then go to the do the outline. I, I talk about that briefly, and and so so you're getting yourself prepared by by writing that outline down and having your your notes ready. I then get the lecture, and you're taking detailed notes that you're now going to when the time comes to write this essay to review what I said. Okay. If you have any questions, please again go to the supplemental lecture instructions. But if you need to talk to me. Ask me anything you like anytime. If you want to have a Zoom session with me and, and talk live about anything like this, please. That's what I'm here for, guys. Reach out, and I will do that for you, okay? Um, I, I've had a you know, number of Zoom sessions so far this semester. It's a great way to connect and talk to people. And, you know, when you hear me and see me, it, it, it tends to make more sense or, or, or it sinks in anyway, okay? Okay, let's let's get going here. So, now, so this is our first outline, so always introduction. So association between humans and trade, ancient trade networks and markets. So, so I'm asking you, what was the association between humans and trade? How, how, how are humans and trade similar or what, what's their association? And then, and then uh, talk to me about ancient trade networks and markets to start the, your paper. So essentially, this, this, uh, this lecture has the intro. And then I'm going to talk to you about two different ways of trade. Trade by water, trade by land. Trade by water, give examples. Rivers, streams, and, and then, of course, rivers. I want you to name them. And I'm going to give you what the rivers are, and I'm going to show you slides. So it's not difficult, but, but write them down. So, so when you do your essay, if it says name them, name them. Don't skip over it. If, if a point's on the essay, write about it. That, that doesn't mean that you're not going to write about anything else. You should be writing about, it, about other things. But if it's on the essay... It says Mediterranean. Tell me about the Mediterranean. Don't skip that, okay? <clears throat> the trade by waterway, rivers, name the Mediterranean significance. Trade by land, the Trans-Saharan trade. Why'd they do that? Uh, what part did camels and oases play in the Trans-Saharan trade? Uh, details about, and then, and then the next part, the, the next type of trade by land is the Silk Roads. And there's a, a specific person I want you to identify, okay? And then the relevance at the end of the lecture, I will give you the relevance, okay? Okay, let's get started. So, so human history developed because of trade. It, it didn't develop because of warfare and conquest. Uh, these conflicts developed very early in human development, usually over disagreements or access that had to do with trade, okay? So the history of humans is the history of trade. They parallel each other. It's the one central theme that runs through all of history. That's the association right there, okay? History of humans is the history of trade. They parallel each other, okay? That's, that's the point from your outline. Uh, okay, so people go out in the world to find and develop trade networks. Why is this? Apparently, it's human nature to seek and explore uh, in, in general, people want to mix with other people. We have a social element about us, or built into us, I should say. But it's also about goods and improving one station in life with products that please us. Many times we have products that others want and, and vice versa. They have products that we want. So what, what happens? Tra a trade system is developed. And that's what the world is all about in the ancient days. It's about trade. The history of humans parallels the history of trade. Uh, in ancient times, it may have been about different types of food or ways to keep warm or new tools to hunt with or weapons to protect yourself with. But it's not a lot different today. I mean, today we can go to this great big market and with a piece of plastic or a few pieces of paper or a handful of coins, we can buy what we want. Uh, it's not the same as, as trading you know, sheep for some seeds or you know blankets for a mule like the ancient people did. We don't we don't do that. You you can't take a horse to Costco and expect to get some food out the back door. Okay, but you're still trading. You you, you have what they want. What well, what Costco wants is plastic and, and dollar bills. And if you have enough of it, you can have whatever you whatever they have. Uh, so it hasn't changed that much. So, so again, why did people, why did early humans venture out from Africa or the Middle East? What made them finally go out? 
to spread out and find opportunity with land, yes, but mostly to trade and because they could develop their own trade networks and hopefully become very wealthy, okay? Okay, so the next point in the outline is trade by waterway. So understand, I, I told you before, I'm not going to always go into great detail like this, but this is the first one. There's, there's two types of trade by waterways that you need to talk to me about here, okay? This is the first one. Uh, the easiest method of transporting goods was by water. There were no roads or transportation corridors on land. I mentioned it was overgrown. Some towns and villages were linked by footpaths rather than roads. Uh, but for the most part, especially with goods, it's very difficult to move across the land to new areas, looking for new markets because the geography held you back. Uh, so the first extensive trade routes were up and down rivers. River valley civilizations are, are who the early civilizations are. All the early ancient civilizations were always around a river valley, a, a place where a river would would you know dump into the ocean because the because the uh, land is fertile from the river, all, all the minerals, and you could grow there. You had the, you had a river for for transportation. So rivers were what it was all about uh, in the very, very early days. So all, all the ancient civilizations were typically located next to waterways. Uh, and you have rivers. So here, here I'm naming the rivers for you. Okay, The Nile, Tigris, and Euphrates I mentioned is where the Garden of Eden was supposed to have been. The Tiber, the Yellow River, the Mississippi River. There, there are many more, but this is kind of a good starter list. Okay. So make sure that you write those names down because the because the outline says so. Okay, um, so that's our first type of trade by water by uh, on rivers because of the of the inability to to, to cross uh, the land very easily. But as ships became sturdier and more trustworthy, people ventured further out, and coastal trade was extended. And human contact was extended, and wealth was created. So the next, the, the next part of your of your trade by waterways is the Mediterranean Sea. So here you see this, this the sea here, and it's an interesting place. You could say it's almost a lake, with the exception of that little spot right there, that is called the Strait of Gibraltar. It's only nine miles wide. This entire sea, if if that was not open, there would be a lake. Now today there's a there's a uh, the Suez Canal, but in those days it wasn't like that. But this is Africa, this is the Middle East. People are are moving out and they find this waterway, and this is where all the ancient ancient civilizations are centered around: Egypt, Greece, Rome. Okay, all the this the Spanish Northern Africa, uh, Tunisia, Phoenicia, Alexandria, all these great trade cities all were around this waterway it gave them a a common place to be the the ocean i'm sorry the sea gave them the ability to 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 transfer goods by by ship and fishing it, it became the center of civilization so, so the significance of the mediterranean sea is that it, it became the early ancient center for trade it still is today, but but in the ancient days there wasn't much else going around, going on or anywhere else, at least in the in the uh, western part of the landmass of Africa, Asia, and 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 Europe. This this was the center of it all. Okay, so now we're going to move to trade by land. Okay, so the Trans-Saharan trade. Uh, trade over land was greatly improved with this with this Trans-Saharan trade. Uh, so. You look at that picture and you think, why would they ever consider doing that? You're not talking about five or ten miles. You're talking about hundreds of miles of, of vast, wide, hot, sandy, dry desert. Why would you want to transport goods across that, that, you know, that challenging desert when you can simply go, go south? Okay, looking at, at the map of Africa, you see that the top – Almost half, not quite, is a, is a huge desert. Okay, so most of the wealthy traders in Africa were were around the what it, what's what, what's called West Africa, Ghana, Mali, and all these places here. The, these people have more wealth than anybody on the planet. Africans talking about uh, if you brought the wealth that they had 
forward to today in our dollars, they would far surpass anybody alive today. They were that wealthy. Why, why would they want to challenge themselves across this desert to get up to here when they can simply go down here to trade? Well, I mean, they, they did go down here to trade, but why would they cross this desert? This is a very important part of your of your essay. They, they, they crossed the desert to get to European markets because right across that, there, there's that Strait of Gibraltar again. This is the Mediterranean. You're, you're now up where you can trade with Europeans. Europeans need the goods. You know, Euro Europeans, you know, want uh, uh, goods because they didn't have them, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, so the challenges of traveling over land and over a desert were overcome and an overland system was developed because the prize at the end of it was a very lucrative market. So it's important to understand this. New technologies and systems develop and, and former obstacles are overcome because they make people money. It's, it's like economics 101, okay? Um, so, so, so they figure it out. But so, so how did they do that? How, how do you cross this enormous desert and survive it? Well, the first thing is the camel. So they tried with horses. The horses they tried with oxen. Horses and oxen died. They couldn't do it. They, they can't store enough water. But the camel is a unique animal. Uh, so what's so important about a camel? Well, camels can withstand changes in body temperature and water consumption that would kill most other animals. They have a series of physiological adaptations that allow them to withstand long periods of time without any external source of water. When a camel exhales water, vapor sorry, becomes trapped in their nostrils and it is reabsorbed into the body to conserve water. You get the visual picture there, right? Okay. Uh, camels do not store water in their humps. It's not what the hump's about. That's not how that works. A camel's hump does not hold water at all. It actually stores fat. The fat is used as nourishment when food is scarce. Uh, if a camel uses the fat inside the hump, the hump will become limp and droop down. So here you see the camel with the droopy hump. That means that that, that, that camel had to access that food source in, in, in their hump to, to survive a, a period of time, okay? So, so camels could survive the harsh desert where other transport type animals couldn't. The horse, oxen could not survive the trip, but the camel can. Okay, so, the, so there's your transport system. But what about people? How do they survive that long desert? Uh, I mean, it, it's going to take you weeks to cross this desert. Okay, it's it's not going to be a few days. It's going to be weeks, maybe months, across that desert. Uh, so how how do humans survive? Well, they, they find what are what's called an, an oasis. <clears throat> so you've probably seen the stereotypical person lost in the desert, and they're seeing a mirage, and there's palm trees and water. It, it's kind of true. They, they do have spots in the desert where there, there, there's a spring, and the a water spring. So the way that you know that is because eight palms are growing out of the middle of the desert. Okay? Uh, that means that there's some sort of water source there. So the, the traders, the African traders going across the desert, learned that these, these places are out there, okay, uh, and that they're very important that, that we understand that we need to, you know, know where they're at. So they end up mapping these, and instead of just blindly, you know, starting down here and going across the desert like this, there's no water if you go in the straight line here. They, they hopscotch. You go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, you're done. Or, you know, here to here to here to here to here to here to here. Whatever it might be, you, you, you map out your journey across the desert by stopping at these oases. So one is an oasis, more than one is an oasis, okay? You stop there, you can rest, you can water your animals, you can, you can replenish your water. You can you can pack water, of course they did, but you couldn't possibly pack enough to get across the entire desert for a, a caravan of, of people and animals. Okay. Okay. Um, so the trans-Saharan trade was developed to take advantage of a market, the European market that wanted new products, and they had the wealth to make it profitable in huge ways. So the Western African traders gained even more wealth than they already had 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 created by 
gold, salt, and slaves, now they've got the European market to send their products to also. So they are very, very wealthy. Okay, the second uh, part of trade by land is the is the uh, Silk Roads that for, for what? Because people have that obsession with Chinese silk, Chinese spice. We talked about that uh, in the introductory lecture a little bit. Uh, the, you know, the people go out in the world because they want to get to China. Okay, they they want to get these get these items in in Europe. Uh, you know, they heard about these products: spices, silk, tea, salt, sugar, porcelain. Your, Europe didn't have that high of a standard of living. They, they mostly ate boiled cabbage with no spice. If you've ever had that, it's pretty bland. Okay. Um, you know, they, they wore wool clothing. It, it was itchy when you'd sweat and scratchy. Okay. So uh, they, they, they knew that Asia was out there, China, but, but how do you get there? It's, it's so far away. Okay. Now you, you look at the entirety there of Asia and you don't even have Europe on the map, Harley. So if you're if you're in London, how are you going to get to China in those days? I mean, it, it's it's so far away. It's it's unfathomable how you're going to do it. Okay. Uh, so they start to come up with different ways to do that. So you're looking at a world map here now. Okay. So so again, if you're in if you're in London, and you got to go all the way across this landmass that you don't even know what's out there. It's it it's not like it's developed. There's bandits everywhere, so people started to want to find a, 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 a – Europeans became obsessed with finding a, a passageway or a quick way to get to, to Asia. So they started to, to go out in the world. First it was to go down the coast and, and you know, see how big Africa is, and, and they went further and further. Oh, it's a big continent. Oh, there's the bottom. You finally can turn. They come up to India. And they started to trade, uh, you know, bases there. And then, of course, they continue on through the islands all the way up to China. This is a long trip. I don't know which one's worse, walking this or, or doing that. But the point is, they, they, they go out, uh, Europeans go out in the world. And this is the start of the exploration phase of history. It wasn't so much to explore. They wanted to get to, get to China, okay, Cause they, because they, cause they wanted those goods. Where did you hear about these goods? Marco Polo. So there's the who of your of your uh, outline. That's the person that you need to identify to get full points for this for this essay. So Marco Polo was a famous Westerner who, who traveled on, on what was called the Silk Roads. Uh, so so what are the Silk Roads? Well, are the Silk Road? Well, it wasn't just one road, but essentially it, it went from China to the Mediterranean. There's that Mediterranean Sea again. That's that's the center of trade. Now the, the Chinese start this this uh, this road uh, uh, back in uh, you know 200 uh, BCE to 200 CE, so about 400 years they're building these roads. What what inspired them to do that? Han China was a huge empire. Han China, of course, is, is all the way over here, right? Han China over here was Rome, the Empire of Rome. Each one knew about the other. <clears throat> from rumor, but they were so far away, they, they didn't really interact that much. So China had the, the brilliant idea, let's build a road to connect, because because why? Because it's all about trade. That's, that's the whole point of this lecture. It's all about trade. Let's figure out new ways to trade. So the Silk Roads are started, but, but they take a long time, and they're very primitive, and it's, it's a challenge to do it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a long, long journey, okay? Uh, but you're trying to link these two regions with commerce, these ancient, the ancient world. Uh, and, and nobody had ever done it until finally Marco Polo did. And Marco Polo came back. Marco Polo starts the obsession in Europe with, with China and Asia and European goods and the idea that, that Asia and China are exotic. And they start calling it the mystical Orient and all these types of ideas. Marco comes back with spices. Now you can put some salt and pepper and turmeric and whatever into your boiled cabbage. You know, throw those wool clothes away, put on this nice silk robe. And this is comfy. People want this. And so they say, Marco, can you go back and, you know, buy me a silk robe? Here, here's the money. Well, the only problem, Marco was gone for 24 years, okay? <laughs> so 
I don't know what kind of business plan that is, but you know, if you, if you if you want to get customers to have to wait 24 years for their product, you're in trouble. So the obsession begins, and, and people go out in the world to find, you know, fast ways to China, an easier, faster way to corner the market to become become wealthy. Marco wrote all of, all about his his travels and the travels of Marco Polo. That's a book you can you can check out at any library even today. <clears throat> Uh, he he became kind of a great adventurer. Uh, this was his great travelogue, and of course, on top of the the goods, Europeans are reading this book of adventure, and they are they are smitten. We we got to get to to Asia, uh, and they began this obsession. So so efforts to find an easy route there became most important. People wanted to access these goods because it would make them make them wealthy. Uh, so the attractive markets in this this is very key. The attractive markets in Asia are what started the age of exploration. Okay, uh, so that makes sense. But what's this have to do with American history? This is American history class, right? Why am I talking about Marco Polo in you know, China and Silk Roads in, in Asia? What could that possibly have to do with American history? Uh, well. Because the obsession with China led to the Europeans going out and and trying to find faster ways there, and one of them, Christopher Columbus, decided, you know, while well, well, they're all going down south around Africa and all the way over to India and that long long trip, I'm going to go west because it's been determined now that the world is round. So I'm going to go around the world and hit China that way. It makes perfect sense. The only problem is uh, Christopher and any other white European didn't know that North and South America was there. Remember the Bering Strait? Well, that that ice that ice age melted, and it and it and it's you know kind of separated the two worlds again. Uh, they were stranded on, on North and South America, and they, they developed their own way over the over the centuries. Uh, white people hadn't come here ever before this, but somehow they managed to survive. They they were flourishing. So the point is the reason why what's that to do with with United States history, it's because of the obsession with Asian goods that Christopher Columbus came west and, and found, ran into America, uh, purely by accident. He, he thought he was in India, and he named the native people Indians, and that name still sticks. Uh, it's, it's an interesting story. If the earth is, was the same size, I'm sorry, uh, the earth is the same size as it is now. If, if North and South America wasn't there, and, and the earth was the same size, we would have never heard of Christopher Columbus. He never would have been seen again. He never would have made it. He would have ran out of food, water, and just drifted and, and, and never been heard of again. So he's lucky that North and South America happened to be there, okay? Uh, so the obsession with, a, with goods from Asia led to, led to Europeans going out in the world and learning that there were two continents that they did not know of, North and South America, okay? Okay, to wrap up the lecture, here's the relevance. So again, you can write it down for word for word. I, I don't expect your essay to be word for word. That's something that happens also with an online class. People just write down what I say. I, I know what I say, so don't do that. But you can, you are allowed to write the relevance down word for word. So here's the relevance for supplemental lecture number one. The obsession for trade goods, especially from China, began the exploration phase of history that resulted in North and South America being found by Europeans. They didn't know it was there. One more time. The obsession for trade goods, especially from China, began the exploration phase of history that resulted in North and South America being found by Europeans. They didn't know it was there. Okay? Okay, so that is the end of supplemental lecture number one. So understand, you want to keep your information that you write about inside of the lecture itself. Don't, don't, I'm going to continue on here. So don't add what I'm saying now into your lecture. You're reviewing the lecture itself. Now we're going back to the main lecture, okay? Oh, this is complicated. Okay, it, 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 it truly is, and I'm kidding. Okay, so back to our colliding worlds. Um, so it, it really is about three different cultures that, that, that collide in what became the, what became known as the New World. The Americans, uh, so who are they? The Native Americans, the people that were here. West Africans, 
uh, people from Africa being brought here as slaves and the Europeans, the Europeans that come and bring Africans with them and they all three come together and clash, okay? And they, they converge on one another as the white European expansion began in America. So using a multicultural lens, we can reconfigure early American history as the intersection between several distinct histories, Native American, European, and African. All three are equally important to the story. Okay, this has been this has been taught mostly in my lifetime anyway, from a European point of view, ethnocentric, Eurocentric, but that's not how we do it anymore. We talk about all three people equally. We tell you, teach you what 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 all three experience, okay? Um, so we're going to take a brief look at, at each of these three people. So, so the old school method, again, teaching of American history was to claim that the people here were savage, uncivilized, and remote scattered people. Uh, and this really starts because of Columbus, the first person to come. So when Columbus first saw the Tainos or the Arawaks, the people in the Bahamas, on the island he landed on. He originally spoke with with the with a peaceful and, and admiring tone about them. He complimented complimented them. But as you'll see at the end of this comment, he kind of changes direction a little bit. They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not know them. For I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make, and here he changes a little bit. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Okay? So he's, he's complimenting them, but he's also somewhat you know a, somewhat of a backhand compliment they're they're nice they're well built they're handsome but they're but they're they're not very uh you know bright they're they're not uh you know uh, militaristic they didn't even know what a sword was and we could we could take advantage of them pretty quickly but, but, but he's still he's still complimenting them okay after several months in the caribbean columbus after calling them gentle now now changes his, his tune a little bit they are evil, and I believe they are from the island of Carib, and that they eat men. He also described them as savage cannibals, dog-like noses that drink the blood of their victims. Wow! So that's a little bit of a change. That this is this is Columbus. Okay. So the cannibal story has no no basis to it. There's no evidence of of these people that were cannibals. You know, cannibalism usually comes from lack of food, and they didn't have a lack of food. They they were relatively peaceful people that that lived a pretty you know, simple life and then a lot and then along came these europeans that changed it okay uh and then christopher columbus starts these racist caricatures about people of color that continue to this day uh they were incorrect then they're incorrect now but columbus starts them and it grows and grows and grows and justification for treating people poorly because of the color of their skin in America, the color of your skin meant that you were a slave if you, if you had black skin, okay? Uh, this cannibal story is taught, in fact, in some schools even today, young, young people are still being taught that. So these three peoples come together and, oops, and the, come on now, and the stage is set, okay? Uh, for these three peoples to collide. And, and again, that's truly what very early American history is about. And it starts with Columbus. Oh boy. Come on. There we go. I'm sorry. This is where all these myths began. Um, and the indigenous people of the Americas were, from the very start, categorized as uncivilized and savage. So, so what do we mean by civilized? So the Oxford Dictionary gives one definition as the act or process of civilizing or being civilized. Well, thanks, Oxford. Like, what kind of answer is that that doesn't, that doesn't answer at all? Go to the next one. The other definition that the Oxford Dictionary gives is an advanced state of human society in which a level of culture, science, industry, and government have been reached. Okay, so Oxford Dictionary is the English dictionary. This is a European point of view here. An advanced state of society, what does that really mean? Culture, science, industry, government, is. you have to have those to be to be civilized. So, of course, 
the word civilized or civilization, it's ambiguous. It's open to more than one interpretation, and it has it, it potentially could have several possible meanings. So civilization, an ambiguous term, often used to denote more complex societies, but sometimes used by anthropologists to describe any group of people sharing a set of cultural traits. So it doesn't have to be advanced state of science, culture, industry, government. It just means a group with a sharing a set of cultural traits. So, so the point I'm trying to get to is, is civilized according to who, you know, people tend to judge everybody else by who they are. So Europeans come and they have this level of science and whatever, and they see the natives and they don't, so they saw them as, as inferior and, and ignorant and savage, okay? Uh, but yet the Native Americans saw themselves as, as, as civilized. They had a, a, a nice life for thousands of years. They lived with, within the land. They, they were just different, okay? What I'm trying to make is that civilized can mean, you know, any, anything to anybody else. Uh, one group might feel like there's someone someone else that calls himself civilized really isn't. We'll talk in, in, the, in this chapter about how that happens, how the, how the natives look at the Europeans who were supposed to be so civilized and think, who are these people and why are they tearing up the earth and committing atrocities on us? So who, you know, who's civilized? Who's the savage? Okay. Uh, so, so again, ambiguous is important. This ambiguous word, open to more than one interpretation. This is important. This is where modern society is linked to the past. This is where ethnocentrism, so we've talked about this before, this idea that, you know, you're, uh, our way or the, uh, the European way, the American way or or whatever your religion, your gender, whatever it is, it's the, it's the only way, it's the best way. The emotional attitude that one's own race, nation or culture is superior to all others. So why is this important? Because this is where the roots of racism and discrimination start. Uh, it, it's a human trait to believe our way is the only way, the right way, and everyone else is inferior. And you can use this idea in civilizations, and you misinterpret a, a, a type of people. And if someone's not like, like, like another, that group will lash out at others who are not like them. And this is where conflicts start in the, in the world. Uh, so ethnocentrism paints world history as well as American history. So if a group, if, I'm sorry, if a group is deemed uncivilized by another, it becomes the justification for cruelty and oppression against those people. And, and of course, that's the story of what happens in the Americas. The, the white Europeans come and, and, and they see these people as lazy, unambitious, and they thought, well, you know, like, we're, we're not going to mix with them very well. They're not like us, so let's get rid of them. Let's crush them, okay? Uh, there, there was never any kind of idea of let's integrate, let's learn about them, how do you do this? You know, celebrating people's differences is, is something that we're still trying to learn to do. And, and in the ancient days, that wasn't done very much at all, if, if, if ever. Uh, so, so again, the, the idea of inferiority has, has led to lots of problems in history and, of course, leads to the, the roots of warfare, aggression, oppression. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, this is this is the kind of world that we live in. Okay, that this is where it starts. So again, history is important because it didn't just happen, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It ha it starts a long, long, long time ago. Okay, that is the end of part one. Uh, please go to chapter one, part two. Thank you.